let's start the broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Dr. Al Rundio. I am a former president of the International Nurses Society on Addictions, and I am coordinating the grant uh, that we have with PCSSO. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. William Lorman. Dr. Lorman is a graduate of MCP Hahnemann University, which is now Drexel University with a master's degree in nursing and is a board certified psychiatric nurse practitioner and is certified as an advanced practice addiction specialist with a CARN AP. He completed his doctoral studies at the American University in Santa Ana, California and also has completed work at the Philadelphia School of Psychoanalysis as a Freudian psychoanalyst. He maintains a private practice in addition to being on the faculty of Drexel University in the graduate nursing program. Dr. Lorman is on the medical staff at Livingren Foundation in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, where he also holds the position of Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer. In his position, he is responsible for all clinical staff and programming for this addiction treatment dual diagnosis facility which provides detoxification, residential rehabilitation, and outpatient services at eight locations in the region. In his private practice, he works with adults who suffer from a full range of psychiatric disorders, mild depression to severe psychoses, and he specializes in addiction psychiatry. He also works with patients who develop psychiatric symptoms as a result of medical conditions. He uses a psychoanalytic medical model and provides services that include individual and group psychotherapy, psychiatric evaluations, and medication management. In addition to his academic and clinical experience, Dr. Lorman has presented seminars on various mental health topics, has written multiple articles and textbook chapters, and is a management and clinical consultant to several major corporations where he provides therapeutic and group facilitation services. He has completed a Juris Doctorate degree and consults in the areas of malpractice and employment law. And it gives us great pleasure to welcome him today. He's going to present opioid dependencies, facts and figures, and also will cover the chronic pain issues and misuse and overdose problems. And at the end, he will speak for around 50 minutes we would encourage you to use the chat box, not the question box, but the chat box to type any question that you have. Now we have a lot of participants on the call today, which is wonderful, so we may have more questions than what we will have time to answer. If that occurs, we will have Dr. Lerman type answers to the questions and we will send it out to everyone. So again, please welcome Dr. Bill Lorman. Okay, thank you, Al. Uh, I'm going to be discussing uh, a, really a bunch of facts and, and uh, figures, some statistics on um, opiate misuse and um, what our, our clinical goal is, is to reduce abuse and overdose of opioids and other controlled prescription drugs while ensuring patients with pain are safely and effective effectively treat it. And this is the uh, major balancing act that, that we that work in addictions um, have with those that work in pain management because we all truly believe that the um, prescribed opiates are excellent, excellent medications and we don't want to deprive patients who need them um, access to them. However, we do want to do a better job at, at managing uh, those patients so that the medications don't get diverted and misused. So the approach that I'm going to take is, is what's referred to as the public health approach to prevention and I'll be going through each one of these steps um, discussing the problems, the risk and protective factors, uh, prevention strategies, and then ultimately adoption uh, which the government has begun instituting. 
So we're going to start with defining the problem. And the first um, graphic I have here is opioid prescriptions dispensed by retail pharmacies in the United States from 91 to 2011. And obviously notice, I mean, it's very intuitive, that as the years go on, more and more opiates are being prescribed. And therefore, we would expect that we're going to see an increase in misuse as a result of, of this uh, tremendous growth. Uh, emergency department visits related to drug misuse or abuse from 2004 to, to, um, to 2010. And um, important to, to note here, um, opiate pharmaceuticals, uh, you can see pretty much a straight line progression there uh, as, as we are from 2009 with all illicit drugs. Uh, opiate pain relievers and benzos pretty much are increasing at the same rate. What's important to acknowledge is that this increase has been going on for some time and continues even to the present day. Uh, one of the things I want to point out, I just finished doing the 24-hour uh, waiver for buprenorphine prescribing, and um, a, a lot of these slides, they, they also uh, have, have used, um, these are uh, public domain slides from SAMHSA, and uh, if, if you're a uh, advanced practice nurse and you're going to do the uh, buprenorphine waiver, you're going to see a lot of these particular slides in, in the several of the presentations. We all, when we saw them, we thought these are, these are great slides. Now, here's another interesting slide, motor vehicle traffic poisoning and drug poisoning overdose death rates from 1980 to 2010. And what's most important, now this is national, uh, national statistics, and, and notice that um, we, we see a crisscross of motor vehicle traffic deaths decreasing and poisoning and overdoses increasing and, and, and crossing over. So today, and that again, that trend has continued uh, to the present and um, you know there was there was an awful lot of concern about motor vehicle deaths, so much so that we even lowered the um, the, the speed limits. But uh, because they've gone down so nicely, so significantly, it seems like a lot of states have increased speed limits. But um, obviously, drug overdoses have increased and in, and by far uh, passed that particular um, statistic there. And another slide, number of drug overdose deaths involving opioid pain relievers and other drugs. So here you can clearly see um, that opioid analgesics by far are increasing uh, more significantly than, um, than other uh, opiate uh, analgesic drugs and non-specified drugs, even though, once again, they're, they're all uh, increasing. So, so this particular trend is, is most alarming. Drug overdose deaths by major drug type in the United States from 99 to 2010. Again, notice the opioids in the red, how that has significantly passed uh, all the other drugs. Um, heroin, you can see stable, but, but is, is rising. Um, cocaine has uh, peaked in 2006, start going down. Um, one of the reasons that the literature states is that um, the opiates, both in pill form and in the um, heroin uh, and, and fentanyl formulations, are more available and cheaper uh, in this day and age. So, um, again, another major concern. So, as far as economic costs, uh, obviously it's intuitive that healthcare costs have skyrocketed as a result of um, opiate misuse, abuse, and, um, and dependence. Um, and, and you can see there that uh, on average annual direct health care costs 8.7, almost nine times higher than non-abusers. So there is a, a huge economic cost in addition to the primary cost of, of um, life or death. So uh, risks and protective factors most important as, as part of the whole education process that, um, that the feds are talking about. 
we, we really need not only those that work in addiction and in pain management, but everybody really needs to understand what are the risk factors, what are the protective factors when working with patients that are utilizing opiates, either using them, misusing them, abusing them, or addicted to them. So the high-risk populations, the correlates to, um, to risk here, people taking high daily doses of opiates, um, people who doctor shop, that's, that's always a big problem, and, and you're going to see the drug monitoring program uh, across the nation, with the exception of one state, will um, hopefully begin to def uh, deter this practice. People using multiple abusable substances like opioids, benzos, other central nervous system depressants, and illicit drugs, uh, these folks are at high risk. Um, Low-income people and those living in rural areas um, also a, a, a correlate. Uh, I, I really worry about um, uh, when, when we talk about the, the socioeconomic levels of folks that, that we don't begin to stereotype this particular group uh, of folks as, as being um, those folks every time we, we get somebody that's low income or living in rural areas are, at, um, are, are, are addicted. Uh, so we really have to be careful of that one. Medicaid populations, again, the same thing. Uh, and people with substance abuse or other mental health issues, certainly the presence of comorbid um, psychiatric or substance use disorders is a, should right away make us think that um, the, the risk is high that somebody would be uh, abusing or misusing opiates. So the four A's of assessment, when we're talking about pain management, does the medication have an analgesic um, propensity, and does the patient spontaneously report that? Are they reporting that when they take their prescribed opiates, does it relieve the pain? Um, are they having any adverse effects as a result of using those particular um, pills? And, and probably to me the most important one working in addictions is activities of daily living. One of the things that we hope to see when pain management is uh, properly prescribed and a good treatment plan is in place is that the patient's functionality should increase. Generally, with the addicted population or the, the population misusing substances, we, we tend to see that, that their functionality stays the same or in fact decreases. Uh, in that population. So we, we have to uh, always be, when we interview and taking histories and, and uh, mental status, that, that we evaluate that. And also look for the presence of aberrant behaviors or other predictors of opioid misuse, which I have some slides towards the end uh, talking about that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about pain and our patients that present with pain and um, understand that there are two types of pain, objective pain, subjective pain. Objective pain is classified as biologic and subjective pain is psychologic. Uh, and, and so I, I always uh, like to quote the Dalai Lama who says, pain is mandatory but suffering is optional. And so uh, what we always want to do is evaluate the type of pain that our patients have. Now, the difference between the two pains, biological pain signals, when the patient spontaneously describes their pain, they use descriptors that we understand. So when a patient says, um, my pain is aching or it's burning or it's sharp, those, those descriptors are very specific and, and we can relate to those, we, we understand those. So when a patient uh, describes their pain using terms like uh, that are listed on this particular slide, um, the, the chances are that they're biological, that they are objective, and that they require intervention. Um, now, psychological pain signals are, are signals in which the patient's emotional system is involved rather than their biologic system. And so we say that these terms pretty much describe suffering, not pain. So when your patient spontaneously uses terms that are listed on, on this slide, uh, awful or agonizing or torturing or distressing, we don't really understand what that means. 
um, when, when the patient describes that. We're, we're kind of lost and confused because we, we don't have a benchmark or, or, or anything that, that we can use uh, ourselves to parallel what they're saying. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that patients that use terms like this are in fact addicted, although there is a, um, um, a significant correlation, uh, we should understand that the terms that they're using are suffering terms and not objective biologic terms describing their pain. So it doesn't mean that these folks don't need treatment, but we need to understand what's really going on with them to a, to a much higher degree um, than with, with the purely biologic. The other thing to um, be very much aware of is don't lead the patient. Don't you use words to describe the pain in which the patient will, will um, respond either yes or no. Um, if you say, is, is your pain um, sharp, um, that, that's a leading question, and psychologically, um, they think that's the answer that you want, and so they will respond yes. So be very, very careful when you're eliciting history that you, you um, avoid leading questions uh, so that you can really understand what's going on with the patient. Now, here are some red flags. Um, of uh, aberrant medication taking behaviors in which the patient is more likely to be suggestive of addiction uh, based on the presentation. So we see, as I mentioned before, a deterioration in functioning at work or socially. That, that's always what we look for, levels of functionality, um, illegal activity, selling, forging, buying from non-medical sources, um, injection or snorting medication, um, I, I, you know, there really aren't, I, I can't imagine a prescriber prescribing a medication, an opiate medication, and telling the patient, crush this and snort it, and you'll get pain relief uh, much better than if you swallow it. So um, that, that also is pretty much a giveaway. Uh, multiple episodes of lost or stolen scripts, so that's the classic. Uh, thing that the patient will say, I lost my script, it was stolen, I just got it, my medication filled, and I left it on the dining room table, and I went out and left the front door open, when I came back it was gone, you know, they have, a lot of times have elaborate stories. Um, they're, they're not, you know, we always have to look at the situation, again, don't stereotype and, and uh, conclude that 100% of the time our patients are lying. Um, there is a, uh, a you know a, a possibility that they could be telling the truth, uh, but you know that's that's really up to you with with your expertise and experience with a particular patient. Uh, resistance to change therapy despite adverse effects. Now that's an interesting one. A patient now now certainly if the patient is is in a chronic severe addiction, they will not report any adverse effects. Or if they're diverting, selling the medication, um, they're certainly not going to report that. But you know, just us trying to understand why would they not want to change um, treatment modality or specific medications in the presence of adverse effects. Um, refusal to comply with random drug screens. Now that is an important indication that um, you, you really need to be aware of. And that really in the beginning has to be part of, of any contract you have in pain management um, is, is that they cannot say no to random drug screens. Uh, concurrent abuse of alcohol or illicit drugs. Again, a, um, a drug screen will identify uh, these things. Uh, so when, when we see that other drugs of abuse are, are utilized by the patient, the risk of abuse of the opiates has, has now increased significantly. And then, of course, the use of doctor shopping, multiple physicians and pharmacies. So these are all red flags suggestive of addiction. But we also have yellow flags. Um, in which it's less likely to be suggestive of addiction. So the complaints about need for more medication. One of the things that the, the literature is, is um, replete with is, is the fact that um, a lot of our patients are under-medicated, that um, we don't really um, deal with the pain effectively as they state that they have it. Certainly, if you have a patient you know, the most common 
error here is a patient that's inpatient or in an outpatient um, medical clinic that it's already documented the patient is an opiate addict, but they do have pain syndrome, either acute, chronic, whatever, um, and they have been abusing opiates. Clearly, um, the, the amount of opiates that they need for um, analgesic purposes is much higher than the general population, and we certainly need to understand that. Um, so, so these folks would be classified as having pseudo-addiction. They're, they're really not addicted. We're just not managing their pain properly. And that really requires uh, a, a really good history uh, and um, physical evaluation of the patient. Drug hoarding um, isn't necessarily uh, a sign of addiction. And, and, and keep that in mind. You know, a lot of times we hear um, accidentally that a patient has a whole medicine cabinet full of medications. Uh, folks in healthcare generally do that anyway um, because, because of, and, and so do most grandmothers, you know, they, um, they, they like to, to hoard medication in case down the line they or a loved one may need that, so they, they kind of are pseudo-pharmacists themselves. So don't automatically conclude that you're dealing with addiction when you have a, a drug hoarding situation. Uh, that just requires better education. Um, patients requesting specific pain medications. You know, um, this, this one comes from, and when, when people conclude that when patients do that, that, um, that that's suggestive addiction, and, and it really isn't, especially today when with, with all of the um, advertising and marketing on TV, um, um, patients' history, uh, knowing what medications work better, um, patients whose, whose friends and family say, ask for this medication or that medication, and it does wonders, you know, so don't automatically jump to conclusions there. Uh, openly acquiring similar medications from other providers. Once again, it looks like um, it's, it's doctor shopping. It needs further evaluation. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm saying you need to further evaluate. Um, occasional unsanctioned dose escalations. Often um, patients will tell me that, um, especially with the benzos, but also with the opiates, that uh, either they, they overworked and strained their muscles and so therefore took a couple of extra doses. Same thing if, if there's some stressors in their life, they increase the benzo use. Again, doesn't necessarily mean, now it clearly is misuse if we go by what the guidelines state, you know, using a particular medication outside of what was prescribed and unknowing to the prescriber that the person was doing this. This is certainly misuse, but isn't necessarily abuse. Um, you know, or addiction. So keep that in mind. And then non-adherence to other recommendations for pain therapy. Um, again, an, another uh, very, very interesting thing uh, when, when, um, I, when I talk to some pain management folks and they tell me about the contracts and the um, non-pharmacologic modalities that the patients have to be engaged in, um, and a lot of times they don't follow those things, um, the, the uh, prescriber begins to think that we're dealing with addiction. And again, it very well could be, um, but it needs further evaluation about why the patient isn't doing that. I know plenty of patients that, that are being prescribed opiates and are also giving scripts for um, physical therapy. And um, especially businessmen who are executives who just don't have the time, or at least they use that excuse, I don't have the time to commit to physical therapy and going um, regularly in which it would be um, helpful. So again, understand why uh, there, there's non-adherence uh, with, with those. So back to some more of our um, statistics. Rates of opiate overdose deaths uh, along with sales and treatment admissions in the United States. So notice the um, parallel uh, progression here um, in opiate sales. You, you can see how that has increased. Uh, opiate deaths has increased. And then also, interestingly, opiate treatment admissions. And so the, um, the, the folks that, that, that are looking, the entrepreneurs that are looking to um, you know, start a treatment program, this slide pretty much demonstrates there's an increased need for more treatment programs. And so we're seeing as a result in um, 
2015, 2016, 2017, uh, the, the increased opening of more and more treatment facilities to, to treat this population. But um, so the, the opiate treatment emissions, that's just kind of a sidebar there, but deaths and sales you can see uh, are, are very interestingly moved together. And um, this is another one of those interesting um, statistics in, in uh, graph form. Um, so the, um, the, um, the color in the states represents the age-adjusted rate of, of uh, death rates uh, in those particular states. The darker the state, the, the increased number of deaths and the um, yellow dots there um, have to do with the number of um, sales or prescriptions to patients. And so the larger the dot, the more um, prescriptions per, per individual are, are utilized. And it, it's, it's clear, I mean, there are outliers, but it's clear that in those states in which there is an increase in prescriptions, there's also an increase in death rates. And those states in which have a very, very low um, incidence of prescriptions, the death rates are much lower. So and, and another interesting um, correlate, which of course the, the government has, has very much been aware of for, for quite a long time. Now here's another one, drug overdose death rates by age uh, in the United States. Uh, again, we're seeing an increase in, in pretty much all of the, um, the age rates. Now nationally, um, the highest deaths per 100,000 are in the 45 to 54 um, age, uh, age rate, um, rates. Uh, I, I can tell you that um, my experience working in in the field and talking to my colleagues that um, the the ones we see are the 25 to 34 year olds. These are the ones that we're seeing dying at a much higher rate. Uh, and I'm talking about Pennsylvania now, uh, which by the way has the highest opiate uh, overdose death rate in the nation right now and um, the vast majority are youngsters, 25 to 34, um, but nationally it's 45 to 54. So you should certainly find out in your own state uh, a, a graph that, that measures death rate uh, by age. Now opiate dose and overdose risk, uh, to me this is an intuitive slide, it's just showing um, now, overdose is defined as uh, includes death, not just death, but hospitalization, unconsciousness, or respiratory failure. So you can see as the um, milligram dosage of drug of the morphine equivalent dose increases, that the overdose risk increases significantly. And as I said, this this ju this is just an intuitive slide. And here are is the adjusted odds ratio in which overdose is defined um, as K of people who died. So this one is just the, um, the actual deaths. So three times um, as, as likely that the person will die when their milligram strength is greater than 200 milligrams per day. Uh, some more um, opiate dose and overdose risk uh, spe with specific populations. So patients um, notice the, the gray line, cancer. So we're seeing overdose risk um, absolute, the highest with, with this population, um, cancer patients. Um, substance, other substance use disorders is the red line with the triangles. But um, chronic pain and acute pain are pretty much um, right on top of each other there. And, and obviously, the, the guidelines say for, for uh, acute pain, we should not be utilizing uh, opiates as first line or for any, any lengthy period of time. So um, the risks and protective factors uh, we just discussed. Now, um, prevention strategies, here we have to rely not only on our professions and, and uh, working with the folks in our professions, but also the government is taking an active role 
in, um, in focusing on, on prevention strategies through education, through monitoring programs, um, disposal programs, and then of course legal enforcement. So uh, strategic focus areas of the government, enhancing surveillance. So, and, and we are in fact seeing the DEA more involved in uh, looking at uh, prescribers and um, doing um, random office appearances. Uh, inform policy, so we're hoping that more policies are going to come out. And then, of course, for us, improved clinical practice. We have to do a much better job in managing our, our prescribing of, um, of opiates and other controlled substances and um, being much more aware uh, in the long run of what's going on. Some of the intervention points that the government is looking at that we should also look at, certainly pill mills, um, have been around forever. Um, problem prescribing, uh, again, a big issue. We 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 will see regularly on um, on the news uh, prescribers who uh, who really shouldn't be or aren't really taking proper precautions. But even general prescribing, a lot of times where we um, automatically and if, if you're anything like me. Um, Patient suffering to me is is if it's allowed is is abuse is is abusive and, and is a sign of abuse, and that we want to get our patients pain free or symptom free as fast as we can, and so we have a tendency of of uh, if we're not careful of using the medications that work the absolute fastest, but also are uh, there's a high risk of um, addiction with those. So we really have to take a better look at our um, prescribing, uh, being, understanding the, the, the prescribing guidelines and, and really, as I said, um, understanding the patient through um, experiencing what they're experiencing. Um, emergency rooms and hospitals, um, especially emergency rooms, that's, that, that is a, uh, a big issue. A lot of times, and I work in a standalone drug and alcohol facility, uh, in which we have a detox and a, and a uh, residential rehab. And often we have patients that for one reason or another need to be sent to the emergency room for um, a, a number of things. And what accompanies the patient, and we don't give it to the patient, we, we either give it if it's by ambulance to the EMT or if it's somebody that our own transportation can uh, take to the hospital, we give the paperwork to, to those folks. And very clearly we state that this patient is in um, drug addiction treatment, please do not prescribe any controlled substances. And I'm telling you, at least 85% of those patients return with a prescription for a controlled substance. So um, again, it's something that we, we have to be very, very much aware of. Um, pharmacies now are also required um, to, to check the uh, drug monitoring program databases when they're filling prescriptions. Um, insurance um, companies and benefits managers also, um, that we're looking for how they can provide some intervention points for us. Um, a general patient and the public, so, so getting the patients more involved and educated, um, especially collateral information, um, concerned significant others, in, in the use of um, controlled substances. And then most importantly, people at high risk of overdose. We, we need to be able to identify and do a risk assessment um, most, most clearly. Uh, as as um, Dr. Rundo pointed out, I, I have my, uh, my law degree. And one of the things that I know that, um, that the courts do when somebody overdoses and dies and, and you're hit with a, with a malpractice liability suit is, um, there's, there's two things that, that the court will look at. Did you, A, identify the risk, and B, did you manage it? They're not going to hold you responsible for a death in which you, you identified risk and you managed the risk properly. You know? But if you're, there's no documentation of you doing that, or if you, in fact, didn't do that, that's where malpractice will, um, will come about. So identifying risk. Uh, and then managing that risk and, and documenting both those both those points. You know, um, as as experts, you um, if if you document 
Uh, I have assessed the risk for this patient, and at this point in time, based on the information I have, um, there's no evidence that this patient is, is at any significant risk for overdose and death. Well, there you go. You, you've pretty much covered it, so you should be okay. Some uh, other CDC intervention uh, recommendations, um, certainly prescription drug monitoring programs. Um, Pennsylvania has always had one for, for a long time. It's only, you know, the beginning of the end of last year, the beginning, yeah, the end of last year that um, clinicians were able to access it. So it was always law enforcement that could access it. The, um, the, the program was there, but, but now um, since the Pennsylvania has made it um, accessible for clinicians, they now make it mandatory. So the way that the statute is written is that now we are held to that, to that guideline here in Pennsylvania. I know that other states have the, the uh, mandation to check it, and some states don't have the mandation. Uh, but rather a recommendation to check it. But Pennsylvania has the mandation, you must check it. So that's part of assessing the risk. So no matter what you think and you write that I don't think this patient is at risk and you never check the um, drug monitoring program uh, database, then you really didn't identify the risk properly. And so you're, you're open not only to a civil suit, but also theoretically because it's a statute, a, a criminal um, action. So uh, just, just be aware of what your state says about prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, patient review and restriction programs. So this should be ongoing, uh, uh, pretty much quality um, assurance, you know, quality improvement is, is doing that. Be aware of any laws, regulations, policies, statutes, um, or, or legal guidelines that are out there. Uh, regarding this. Um, insurers and pharmacy benefit managers, mechanisms, um, so, so be aware. I know that I often get uh, in the mail from some insurance companies a, a listing of medications that the patient is taking with a note saying, um, we think that the, the patient's been on this medication long enough, consider tapering it. And, you know, I, once I see that, I just kind of rip it up. Um, hopefully we don't have any insurers that send me those letters on, on, the, on the call here. Um, but um, you, we really need, I, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've only recently noticed in those things is a listing of other medications that the patient's taking that I am not the prescriber on, and I really need to do a much better job at uh, reviewing those. And then also being aware of the clinical guidelines for prescribing um, both pharmacologically and non-pharmacologic um, in, in, in working with this population. So the prescription drug monitoring programs are operational uh, in, in uh, when, when this came out in 2012, the end, almost 2013, I guess, uh, 42 states. Um, there is one state in which legislation, legislation is still pending, I believe, uh, but uh, pretty much we all have some form of it, so we should certainly be aware of what the rules are for, for you utilizing this um, invaluable um, database. One of the things that a lot of states don't have is the ability to check surrounding states' databases. Um, some states, again, have that. Some states don't. So that, that's another important consideration. Other uh, patient review and restrictions programs um, known as lock-in programs applies to patients with inappropriate use of controlled substances, um, the use of one prescriber, one pharmacy for controlled substances, uh, a really important guideline, uh, and, and a lot of pay management folks uh, institute that particular point in their agreements. Uh, improve coordination of care and ensure appropriate access for patients at high risk for overdose. Um, you know, I, I really get crazed when I hear folks um, utilize HIPAA as a reason why they can't provide information. And um, keep in mind that the, the HIPAA laws are, are, are quite extensive and complex. And I would, I would, um, um, I would state that the vast majority of clinicians really don't understand HIPAA. I know we've all were mandated to go to trainings. A lot of times I find that some of the trainers even are providing wrong information. 
Um, remember, HIPAA is there uh, ultimately to help the patient, not to hurt the patient. So if we're utilizing HIPAA as an impediment rather than as a way to help the patient, then there's problems there. So make sure you understand what, what the laws really state and don't uh, make any judgments or um, suppositions about what's going on. Um, evaluation show cost savings as well as reductions in um, ER visits and the numbers of providers uh, and pharmacies. Certainly, again, another intuitive statement there. Um, some states have enacted laws and policies aimed at reducing diversion, abuse, and overdose. Um, policies strengthen healthcare provider accountability. Um, certainly um, safeguard access to treatment when implementing these policies. So we, we, we don't want to restrict, we want to safeguard. So, so make sure you, you, you understand that. Um, a, a lot of the advocates for pain management are saying that there are a bunch of us out to restrict the use of, of these medications. And, and uh, absolutely not. I, I'm not saying that there aren't those folks out there that are uh, attempting to do that. But in, in general, we really want to safeguard um, the, the, the health uh, of these folks. And rigorous evaluations determine effectiveness and identify model aspects. So here, you know, re-evaluations, reassessments of these patients, um, most important in um, ongoing management. So, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of patients um, that are given multiple scripts, dated, you know, we're, we're allowed now, at least in Pennsylvania, I think it's a federal law though, but you could correct me, that um, for, for um, uh, Schedule 2, we're allowed to um, write out uh, a 90-day prescription and 30-day prescriptions each post-dated. Uh, probably not a, a real good thing, uh, but anyway, that, that's there and a lot of people utilize it, but we really have to be careful with things like that. Um, for pharmacy benefit managers and insurers, um, reimbursement incentives and disincentives, uh, a lot of several insurance companies are really taking a hard look at this. Um, uh, formulary development, uh, quantity limits, certainly an uh, important concept there. Step therapies or prior authorizations, real-time claims analyses, and retrospective claims review programs uh, are important to take a look at. Even if it's retrospective, if we can learn something from our, how we manage our patients and can change our management skills. Um, that, that is certainly important. Um, clinical guidelines, always, always be aware of them. Um, they're, they're available online uh, for free. Uh, they they um, ultimately improve prescribing and treatment. They're a basis for standard of accepted medical practice for purposes of licensure board actions. Not only that, but um, in malpractice cases, the very first thing that plaintiff's attorney will do is get copies of the practice guidelines and then attempt to demonstrate that you didn't follow them. So make sure you're aware of them because if there is a sentinel event, that's the first thing that um, plaintiff's uh, counsel will request. Um, consensus guidelines are out there, common themes among uh, the guidelines that, that you can see as, as you read them. Um, a lot of information out there and available online on the internet. I gave you a couple of, um, of uh, websites here, certainly the CDC, SAMHSA has a lot of stuff, um, NIDA, uh, a lot of government organizations have a, a good amount of, of information on, uh, on this problem. So that's my presentation. We have about 15 minutes uh, for any questions that maybe I can uh, answer for you. So I'll just... Um, just a reminder to type your question into the chat box, and then Dr. Moorman will answer your question. Wow, we have 315 attendees. Excellent. So hopefully, you know, one of my um, guidelines for myself whenever I present is that you, you have at least one, if not more, takeaways that will, will help improve your practice, your management, your understanding 
uh, of, of whatever it is that is being presented. And if you have a question, just type it into the chat box. You will be provided with an online evaluation to take at the conclusion of the webinar, and then your CE certificate will be sent to you. And then we also do another follow-up evaluation 30 days from now. give it another couple minutes for questions. If not, then we will conclude the webinar. Okay, I just got an email from someone that said they can't see a chat option, so um, I'm going to turn on questions. So if you're an attendee and you can see a question, Go ahead and type it there and I can read it out. Or if you want to email your questions to me, it's insa at primemanagement.net. I will send them off to Dr. Lorman and have him type up an answer for you. Um, let's see here. Okay, here. Um, okay, I've got a few here, Bill. I'm going to read them out. Um, is it possible to get a, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint presentations? Yes, we'll have those available. Um, everything should be available on the webinar page of the INSA website, which is insa.org slash webinar. It should be available by this time tomorrow, if not sooner. But uh, check back at least at this time. There should be slides and an archive of this webinar. Um, so one question, Al, uh, or uh, uh, Bill, uh, what more can insurance companies do to assist in supporting physicians? Well, the, the one thing that they can do, um, certainly uh, when, when, uh, when we work with a patient, all we really know is what we're doing with that patient. We don't know what, what other um, modalities or prescribers or practitioners or providers that they have accessed. And a lot of times insurance companies can help us with that in, um, in helping to identify sooner rather than later that a patient is engaged in treatment with other providers. Okay, next one. Uh, will they be shortening the PMP result time? Um, sorry. Uh, so we get results more quickly in real time. Um, and I, I can only speak for Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania um, regulations are that pharmacies must um, supply this information within 24 hours of, of the patient um, picking up the prescription. Okay, next one. You mentioned high-risk population for abuse is living in rural areas. What about urban populations? Well, certainly, you know, and I, and I hate statistics like that. Um, certainly in, in the old days we said that, that our, our prime target area was the urban areas, but we're seeing an increased rate that is, is increasing much more significantly. So the, um, the incidence and prevalence statistics are showing um, a, a, a faster growth in the rural areas, and that's why that, that's mentioned as a higher risk. Um, but you know, again, you got to be real careful of statistics and, and what they mean. So um, I really don't pay too much attention. Um, just like there's, there's demographics for, um, you know, individuals who are at high risk, I, I like to think that um, addiction is, is not related to socioeconomic or, or other issues that we need to universally assess everybody coming in for that. So, you know, the reason that they state rural is because the rate of increase is greater than what they're seeing um, in, in um, urban areas. Okay. Do you prescribe benzodiapazins, diazepens uh, with opioid pain regimen? 
Do I? I, I do not. I, I, um, I work in addiction, so, um, you know, those, those particular drugs are anathema to me. I, I don't prescribe them. Um, whoever is, and I know that um, they are prescribed together. Um, a lot of times the, um, the benzos and the opiates um, compete for the same liver enzymes and therefore we see an inhibition of metabolism and we see uh, increased um, uh, blood levels of, of those particular drugs you have to be careful of. So, um, you know, I can certainly understand where, where people that have chronic um, pain also have significant anxiety and may need both medications. The, the issue is um, make sure you're doing a really good evaluation and a good management of those patients. Okay, next one. Um, it's, there's a couple typos in here, so I'm going to read it based on what I think it says. How do we get rid of press gainy hospitals are rated on how they deal with pain until that changes, EDs will give RXs? Is that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, um, that's always a real big issue. And every time I, I talk about uh, management of, of opiate prescribing, that question comes up no matter what the population that I'm, the target audience or where I'm presenting or who I'm talking to, that, that comes up. And um, I, I read an interesting article just over the weekend on, um, it, was, it was really about how does, um, how did patient satisfaction become customer service? How, how does that happen? Um, you know, and it's about patients uh, being unable to determine or, or differentiate between um, desires and needs, and um, we get evaluated on not meeting patients' desires, and that certainly is a problem with with those um, surveys. And I don't really have an answer for it other than to continue to bring it to light to to the people. Um, who, who utilize those scores that have a better understanding of what they might really mean. Hopefully okay, that next Go ahead. Okay. Next one is when providing education to fellow nurses at my particular facility, many have never heard of pseudo-addiction. When we are talking about the yellow flags, these were signs of possible pseudo-addiction, not abuse or addiction. Is this a common trend that healthcare providers, MDs, and RNs do not know, do not, I think, know about it? Um, I, probably yes, um, although we see it all the time. Um, the folks that, that we brand as clock watchers, um, folks that are always on the bell uh, calling for pain meds, um, more times than not, we're probably dealing with, with pseudo addiction. When, when we encounter those behaviors, our minds immediately go to, this patient must be addicted to these medications uh, or similar medications. And as I said uh, previously, that, that's a possibility, but we have to look to see um, and determine, are we in fact properly treating the pain uh, or anxiety? You know, we could, you could deal, deal with um, benzo um, addiction also, and there's somebody overutilizing benzo. So any any of that, uh, any of those um, controlled substances, we always need to first evaluate: Are we doing a real good job at managing whatever symptoms that we're trying to manage? And then, um, you know, then then go to whatever's next. You know, a lot of times I'll hear um, nurses say, you know, the patient has has been. Um, um, sitting on their their um, bell, their patient bell alarm for a, a long time, and I go in there, and the patient's sleeping, and I wake them up, and very drowsily they say, "I need my pain med," um, and and so they conclude that this this must be um, addictive behavior and not pain um, breakthrough pain. Um, and again, that's possible. But remember the slide with the um, psychological signs of addiction, I'm sorry, of pain. Um, the patient may be experiencing emotional pain, and at, at, especially if they have been chronically using um, 
pain medications may have a difficult time separating the two. And then, of course, the other thing is when people have been on pain medications, opiates in particular, for any long period of time, what we see is hyperalgesia. Uh, the patient is, is much more sensitive. Their, their, their threshold for pain has, has um, gone down, and they feel um, or they interpret pain as severe even when you and I wouldn't uh, consider it um, even mild. So there's, there's a lot of considerations here uh, with that. And all I ask is keep an open mind, do a thorough assessment, um, look for consistency, look for con conflicting information, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Curious if the presenter has used an SBIRT framework to address opioid use as an early intervention strategy. And if so, do you have any thoughts about your experience? Well, I already work in an addiction treatment center, so I don't need to refer to to myself. They they come in the door. The whole issue is really educating folks outside of addiction treatment centers, like emergency rooms, hospitals, outpatient care centers, um, private um, providers on on the SBIRT uh, model, and and um, have, and educating them properly on that, but. You know, before that they can um, uh, refer, they, they need to understand how they need to screen pretty much everybody that comes into their office. Okay. Can you say more about how NPs can fulfill the 24-hour training and does this count towards those hours, it says? Does, no, this, this particular presentation does not count towards the 24-hour um, waiver training that you have to do. You can um, access um, the trainings which are free through AANP, through the um, uh, PA has the physician's assistant has their, their, their own portal for doing that. Um, it, it's all uh, found on the ASAM um, website and, and you can log in for free and, and begin the training and do it at, it's independent study so you can do it at your own pace and um, when you get done, you go back to your um, hosting organization, whether it's AANP or the physician's assistants or whoever else um, is um, sponsoring it to get your CEs. But right now, that, that's the only program that, that is available and that, that, um, that counts towards the waiver. Okay. What are a few of the red flags and what can residential facilities do to assist with the decrease of opioid use? Well, I, I'm not sure I, I understand the, the spirit of the question. Um, we, we want to um, decrease um, opiate use. Um, the the um, short answer, which doesn't really decrease opiate use but prevents um, overdose deaths, is the um, the public use of naloxone uh, and the availability and access of that. So educating those folks as a as a band aid measure until we can figure out how to better manage um, opiate um, misuse and diversion. You know, obviously um, we we don't prescribe heroin yet. There's um, a good amount of heroin out there, and people are dying from heroin and fentanyl overdoses and uh, other other morphine. Um, derivative uh, opiates, so um, it's it, it's really much more complex than being able to manage it. Let's let's use the band aids first, which which would right now be um, uh, medication assisted treatment with the use of naltrexone, Vivitrol, um, buprenorphine, or uh, and there are several products now on the market, and then also uh, education and access of naloxone. Um, you know, nasal. So, so that's that's probably how to, to how we can get started with that. Okay. What percentage of overdoses are due to opioids and benzos combined? I I don't know whether that statistic is available right now, and if there is a statistic, it's probably incorrect. And um, I know that the states. Um, through through some um, federal work are, are trying to change um, the way that um, medical examiners list cause of death 
on on the death certificate. So um, a lot of states still require the um, organ system failure listed as the cause of death rather than um, say opiates. So if the person uh, overdosed on opiates and died of respiratory failure, the death certificate um, that that um, that gets registered is going to say respiratory failure and not opiate overdose or benzo overdose. Um, so hope we're, we're I'm seeing in the literature that that more and more states are now um, requiring the use of um, toxicology and having that listed on the death certificate also. So un until we we have that across the country, we really won't know what that statistic is. All right. How do you see provider-based practices who are prescribing opioid slash pain management aligning with acute care facilities to support, promote safeguards? Well, hopefully there there will be better communication as as um, as a first step in in providing that. So um, we all know that when we get a patient from from a hospital into our practices, it's rare that we get the uh, medical records, even when we request it. And when patients are admitted to the hospital, it's rare that they'll that we're even aware of it. And they don't, you know, except in a, a few cases, won't will never um, contact us to get our information. So um, communication is is the first step there, so that we can be consistent, that we can be knowledgeable about holistically and integratively about the patient's um, situation and history, medical history, psychiatric history, all of that, drug and alcohol history. Uh, we've we've gone over our our um, time boundary here, so um, I suggest that we end and anybody has any other okay. questions, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to answer them through the email. Okay, yeah, and I'll make a copy of all the questions right. and have them available. They probably will not be available tomorrow, you'll have to give, uh, for those people listening still, they'll probably be a few days before he can get those answered and posted online. But we will have the archive and the slides probably available by, t by this time tomorrow. And don't forget to complete your evaluation when it arrives electronically. Uh, we take your feedback very seriously, and we thank you for being here for this webinar, and thank you, Dr. Lorman, for uh, presenting such a wonderful webinar.